think we're good. Um, all right. I, I, you know, I'm not going to waste anybody's time any further. And I, I know we're going to get right down to business and bring on the man that everybody's here to see today. So without any further ado, please welcome my very good friend and tremendous musician, the great Gavin Harrison. Hey, John. Hey, Gavin. How Great to doing? see you, man. Good to see you in your lovely drum room. Ah, uh, well, thank you. And likewise, my friend, that that's, I mean, that's a drum room right there. <laughs> what are all these medals you've got in the background? Are they like from skateboarding or something? <laughs> <laughs> What's all that? Yes. You've got a, it looks like all, all awards you've won. Those are all the uh, gold and platinum records that I, I didn't play on. They're, um, well, you know, those, the, those in the old days, in the old days of, of the music business, bands would send you gold and platinum records when they, when their records went gold and platinum, you know, for, for being part of it. And, and uh, so these are from various Zildjian artists and like Aerosmith and wow. uh, a whole bunch of bands. Yeah. I mean, um, Soundgarden, you know, Matt Cameron and a whole, you know, Pulse, Metallica, um, so yeah, I I just have yet to to sort of put them on the wall. That big one, if you, uh, that's sort of up above next to the window. If you can yeah. follow my yeah, that's uh, a Def Leppard award from the, I guess it's probably from the late '80s, early '90s when you know, bands used to sell like you know 10 million records, and they they'd send you these wow. beautiful plaques, you know, with like 10 little you know miniature CDs in there, and and um, yeah. Nowadays, you get 10 million plays on Spotify and a and check you... for $5. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. I know. Wow. I know. It's... It's... How many kits have you got now in your collection? I've, I've got, I have have a total of 11. Right. Um, yeah. And you're, so... you're still married? <laughs> Barely. <laughs> Celebrating 20 years in two weeks, but, and I'm hoping I make it that far. <laughs> she, Just she one says hello, more drum by the way. set. One more drum set is all I need. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. And Kelly says hello, by the way. When I I told her, you know, she of course remembers you and Oh and, great. How's she doing? Yeah. All good? She's doing great. Yeah, she's doing great. She's excited. I as as I mentioned to you, we're uh going up to see our grandkids later today. So we're just we're actually gonna stay overnight tonight. So we've packed our bags and mm. excited about it. So this is a nice room, John. Have you got air conditioning? Yeah, we do. We have we have air conditioning in the house. So this is where I am is the, the basement. It's a finished basement. And I've got this room and then there's another room and I keep threatening to do this. I've got another room where I've got like seven or eight kits set up in a, in a larger um, sort of playroom area where we've got like a TV and entertainment center on one side and then I've got all these other drum sets set up. So, um, but, you know, it's uh I think I've seen a, I think I've seen a picture of it yeah it's like yeah do you ever have those dreams where you're you're dreaming you're walking around some town in a foreign land and then you suddenly see this shop you think, oh, it was a drum shop and then you go in and it's like full of all your favorite vintage equipment and that's that's like when I see your the picture <laughs> of your room it's like wow I've walked into this room but I'm in a parallel universe because everything's set up backwards. It's all, <laughs> it's all like this. And then I, I wake up in a sweat, sort of nightmare. <laughs> oh, everything's set up wrong. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, you know, that would be that would be like a nightmare. Like you 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 see, oh wow, I've been looking for one of these vintage, you know, drums. Yeah. And then you go, oh, oh, but it's backwards. I can't play it. <laughs> you get it home and you can only set it up backwards. It's like just it won't go the other way. Hey, you got a nice Heyman kit there. You know, yeah. my old buddy. Uh, I was really good friends with a with a drummer who sadly passed uh, three years ago. His name was Paul Brody, and he was the um, the drummer in the big band of the BBC. And he said to me once, he's walking down Shaftesbury Avenue. If you know Shaftesbury Avenue in yes. the centre of London, yeah, in the late sixties, and a guy from behind him shouts out, "Hey, Paul!" Hi, he said, I'm George Heyman. He said, I want to build you a kit. I've got enough birch to build 50 kits and I want to build one for you. How wow. That? Yeah, that's that amazing. First time. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that, 
that must have been such an amazing time. I mean, it's I, I love London, but to I, I, I wish I could have, you know, lived there or been there during the, the sort of heyday of all those great shops, you know, and, and um, you know, um, Drum City and, and all the places yeah. that um, and you, you grew up in London, right? So you probably yeah, I these. knew all that. My dad would take yeah. me, uh, you know, my dad used to play in this sort of Vegas style cabaret club called the talk of the town and they would have visiting artists come over stevie wonder judy garland mel torme oh, hundreds and hundreds of artists would come over and they would do a month in cabaret and if there was someone really interesting on drums because they'd quite often bring their own drummer my dad would take me off school and take me to the uh, the center of london where the club was and i would sit and watch the rehearsal that's how i met louis belson Wow. I literally sat next to Louis because he, he was playing for his wife, Pearl Bailey. And I sat next to Louis. I mean, this is like, wow, I just can't believe it. I don't know, I'm about 13 years old. And then I would go to visit uh, Drum City where my drum teacher worked and Rose Morris, which was on Shaftesbury Avenue. And of course it was, you know, I was a kid in a candy store because in the late seventies, the shop window was full of uh, Ludwig Vista lights. But, yeah. you know, like six, eight, 10, 12, these enormous kits with like eight toms or something, which was amazing to me because I'd up till that point, everyone just played a marine, you know, pearl white marine sort of buddy rich sort of setup, you know, which wasn't so interesting for a, a young teenager. But when you see these Vista light kits, like concert tom kits with very imaginative setups, I would just stand there at the window like, wow. Yeah, this is unbelievable. Really exciting times, actually. I I know. I I remember like same thing. Like going in, like when I whenever I'd be able to go into Boston as a, as a young kid, maybe with my dad or something, when I wasn't driving yet. And back they they had like at one time the, a shop that I ended up working at later on. It was a a, a full line music store called EU Wurlitzer, but there was Jack's Drum Shop around the I know corner. Jack's, from the, yeah. Remember, yeah, you know, Jax, there was Wurlitzer. There's a place called the Drummer's Image for a short period of time on uh, on the same street as Wurlitzer on Newbury Street that was there in the, in the early mid 70s. And and like you'd see these kits in the window and it was like, I can't even you know what I mean, though. I can't even explain it. It was just this excitement, this like yeah. euphoria. And you'd go in and they'd have like, you know, like just different a Ludwig and a Gretsch and a Rogers and a Slingerland and a Premier and a like, right. oh man, yeah, yeah. It's... But later on in life, you're not trying to recreate that, are you? No, not at all. <laughs> so look, how many of these have you done? Is this is number forty-two, right? This is number forty-two. Yes. Do you, yep. do you know the ex the expression um, "scraping the barrel"? <laughs> I have to tell this, everybody. This must be the bottom of the barrel by now, John. No, come on. I have to tell everybody what what you said when we were doing checking the sound and the levels, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I can tell you right now, there's a whole bunch of people commenting and watching and stuff. And I, so everybody watching at home, I said to Gavin, "This is going to be great." You know, there's a lot of people that are going to be watching today. It's there's been great response, you know, to the, to the promotion on Facebook and elsewhere. And and Gavin, of course, said, "Well, you know." just because I'm popular doesn't mean I'm a good, I can play or whatever you said. And it was classic, typical humility, but no, this, this is uh, you, you're, I have to tell you, I'm going to just, I'm going to jump into this and say that. So I, I remember when I, we've known each other a long time, but the first time I saw you play with King Crimson, which was 2014. And I think that was the first year you toured with them. Is that right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, and we'd had a great dinner the night before, we, which was great. You had a night off in, in Boston and we had a really fabulous dinner at this great Italian restaurant. And I went to the gig and it was leading up to this, my first gig with my band that I've been with now since that time. And, and I was really nervous about it. And you just, you just, I don't know, you made me feel so comfortable. And it's just, it was so silly that I was like so worked up about playing covers in this, you know, I, I look at what you do with King Crimson and, and like what you have to deal with and what you do every night. And it's just incredible. It's just it's it's beyond anything I can comprehend. And I'm, and I'm saying to you, yeah, Gavin, you know, I just I'm I'm, I'm worried that my time isn't going to be good. And 
<laughs> and and you and you just you were just saying things like oh man it's going to be fine you just got to you just got to enjoy it and and be in the moment and relax and and it's going to be all right and and then i saw you play the next night and i just remember feeling so inspired and and maybe you can remember this too as a kid when you'd see a great band and a great drummer play it made you so excited to like want to go play a gig with your band right i mean that's i mean Oh, we don't yeah. play King, yeah. We don't play King Crimson music, but it's just it seeing you and and Bill was in the band at the time, Bill Reiflin and Reiflin and and uh, and of course Pat Mastelato and um, and it just inspired me to just I couldn't wait to do the gig. Oh, great! Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, I mean I had a lot of great opportunities when I was a kid. My dad would take me, you know, to those rehearsals. He would take me to the BBC. He would take me on like gigs. If guys were doing local jazz gigs, he would go along and he would say, can my, can my son sit in? You know, I'd be like 12 years old sitting in with these guys. And they all had a big smile on their face. There was no pressure. You know, mm -hmm. even when I saw the guys at the BBC playing with the big red light comes on when they're in record, you know, it was, it was natural. It, it didn't give me that kind of red light fever yeah. that some people go, oh my God, we're in record. I better not screw this up. It, I, I'd grown up watching professional guys deal with those situations. And so, you know, I have played in some really high pressure situations. And it's, it's not true that I don't feel the pressure. I do feel the pressure. I just think, well, I've probably played the drums more than anything in my life other than, you know, sleeping and breathing. Um, so, you know, what's the worst that can happen? I, I, I've never sort of gone into a nosedive and crashed I, I can yeah. always pull myself out of it and the nerves and the anticipation actually make it worse and you probably end up do playing badly because you're nervous so it's a it's an internal battle you've got to reason with yourself in the end and find a way around it you know and some of the best and biggest things I ever did were under huge pressure you know like the modern drummer festival or or the Dave Letterman show or mm. any of those situations the, the pressure was enormous and I could feel it, but I didn't let it ruin the day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and I, I can see that about you too. Like, um, I, you're, you're always prepared. You're always, uh, I remember the, the, the duet you and Simon did at the guitar center thing years mm. ago, the guitar center, <clears throat> drum off and and you guys had like and and you guys remind me of each other a lot maybe it's the accent i don't know um <laughs> no <laughs> you know he grew up about a mile from where i am now uh, isn't it I, and, and there's a history between your both your dads yeah, too did they yeah, that's right yeah yeah which is so cool and but i just remember like just talking to you guys before i don't know if you remember the, the you you guys pulled me into this photo shoot with jojo was there and and uh and there's pictures of it. It's hilarious. Like they're trying to get pictures of all the artists playing. And Simon goes, come on, come on. <laughs> there's pictures of like, you know, me photobombing anyway, but that's, that's not the point of this, but you guys were talking about how you had prepared for this and, and you're just so professional and, and uh, it's a great example of, of what it, how you have to be prepared for the gig. Like you can't, um, you, you can be spontaneous, but you can't wing it though, either. Right. I mean, it, does that make sense? Well, you can, you can wing things if you're in a very easy environment with a few guys in a pub and yeah. you've had a couple of drinks, <clears throat> but you know, under pressure, all the confidence of being able to wing things under pressure that will go out of the window, right? You can't just sit there and improvise an incredible solo or or a really complicated piece of music and just wing it when you're under pressure you know it's like you know when you're at home and no one's watching you can play amazing things as soon as yeah. you get in front of an audience hang on all those amazing things just have vanished <laughs> so if you want to if you want to kind of be able to pull those things off yeah you've you've got to have it on you know pre pre-worked out to a degree i think especially when it's a one-off event like the thing I did with Simon or the first four five six nights on the tour you kind of you're just concentrating so much 
to get through it is such a strange thing to you the first few nights of a tour there's so many foreign things and after about six or seven nights a lot of things start to become automatic you stop worrying about things you start listening to the other guys and then you can start to improvise or change things and enjoy it more I never really enjoy the first two or three nights of any tour because I'm really so concentrated on what I've got to do and I just want to prove to myself I can get to the end without messing it up I need to do that four or five times before I feel like oh now I could try a different fill or now I could try something crazy you know yeah, I think there's a, yeah. a confidence that comes with familiarity and repetition of course yeah that's good to know that that's good to know that and and so when you like you guys are going to tour this year it looks like it's yeah you'll be back out yeah that's that's fantastic news by the way congratulations i had uh jeremy on a couple of weeks ago on your birthday in fact oh we wished you a happy birthday that day we, we figured you weren't watching because it was your oh. birthday <laughs> And uh, and we he he was hinting around. I think it wasn't official at that point. He said that it's looking like some things are going to happen or something. But um, but no, but anyway, it's, so it's all sorry. official now. If you if you do a search, you'll find the entire King Crimson USA tour. You'll you'll find it online somewhere. I think we're coming out for six weeks, and we're covering a lot of towns. So um, there'll be a lot of outdoor gigs, which will be nice, especially from a sort of social distancing point of view, if you're a bit nervous, you know, or a bit apprehensive about being in a venue or wearing a mask or, you know, there'll be, a, I think there's a lot of amphitheaters and yeah. I think half, half of the shows are with the Zappa band uh, opening up for us. So I, I'm really looking forward to that too, because I'm a massive Zappa fan. Yeah. So just to sit and watch a great band, you know, with all those guys who've played or being part of the Zappa, uh, experience it'll be it'll be great for us guys to to sit and watch that we're really looking yeah. forward to it do you know who's playing drums in in the zappa um band i don't i don't actually know because i'm i'm unsure that i think there's two different zappa bands mm -hmm. um one which dweezel's part of and one which um i think moon and amet are part of I, see. So I don't actually know. Just curious. Yeah. Oh, Chris, Christopher Layton says Joe Travers. And I wondered if it was Joe. Oh, great. Um, he's amazing, yeah. isn't he? Boy, he's great, what great a drummer. Player, yeah. I've seen yeah. some videos yeah. of him playing the Zappa stuff. Man, he's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, good. Good. I didn't know if you knew Joe. Yeah. He's a, he's a fine, fine player and a really great guy. Yeah. Super great guy. Yeah. So, so, but anyway, so, leading up to the tour and and like working out your solo that's and and i know i know the answer to this question it's you've you've worked you've worked that out ahead of time but there are times as you say a, a few shows in you'll start to maybe change it and improvise a few things well the solo i do get to play one solo every night mm -hmm. and actually the challenge for me is to play a different solo every night i don't actually work out what i'm going to play I probably did right at the very beginning, 2014, I figured out a few things. There's one cue that I need to give the band to take us back after the drum solo. Yeah. Other than that, I think the fun of it is because, you know, obviously the band have heard what I played last night or the night before, the fun of it is to really try to do something different. You know, I think the first few nights you get past the uh, point of, playing all your licks and all your clever fast things and you think yeah okay that's fine but what could I really truly improvise and play something that I've never ever played before that's kind of exciting and I yeah. don't know where it's going to go so you need to get into that headspace where you are really on a knife edge of almost following yourself you don't know you might play something and think oh that was good I'll do that again I'll make that into a theme and then I could play it in a different way. And then I'll come back to that and, uh, you know, have some strategies rather than just, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, you know, you haven't got time for that. So, you, you know, I sometimes, because I don't play in the minute or two before I do a drum solo, I sit there thinking, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? 
and I think of something and then right two seconds before I go to do it, I change my mind <laughs> like something else. And, uh, you know, some are more successful than others. Um, but I think the audience appreciates that you are really trying to do something unique that night um, and that you, you know, you could make a mess of it. You could do something really good. Or the worst thing is that you just bore yourself by playing all your same old licks. So <laughs> but that's what I don't want to do. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But at the same time, I'm sure you, you realize this too, that they may be boring licks to you, but if you're in a different city every night, there's a whole lot of drummers coming out to see you guys every night and those yeah. what seem to be boring licks to you they you know they want to hear those you, i know, you know but what i mean i can i can tell when drummers are regurgitating things they've practiced a million times right i can just tell oh that's yeah. a lick he's practiced for for years and years and years you know so i i've taken the strategy of trying to play themes and melodies you know i've got quite a big kit sometimes i at the sound check, I've got these two Nord pads, you know, it's they're like six pads. It's, mm -hmm. it's a nice kind of analogy electronic drum thing. And I know some notes that fit the key of the song we're playing in. So I'll type those notes in and I'll set a Nord pad up here and I've got one around the other side and I'll put some notes that I know will work with the piece. It won't sound like totally, totally out of the key. So I might start on those or I might start playing those and the drums. And I think if you're open to it, you can start to recognize little melodies and kind of counterpoint melodies and try to build your drum solo from a melodic point of view, mm. rather than, you know, the old school way of everything coming off the snare drum, you know, Buddy Rich style, everything with incredible chops and, yeah. you know, that was more the, the the approach of playing a drum solo back then was it was snare drum focused the toms and the cymbals were just occasional things but you know I've, i guess i've tried every strategy i could think of in terms of um trying to find a creative way to play a different drum solo every night you know yeah sometimes i've thought about it for a long time and then sometimes the best ones are the ones that I really don't know what I'm going to do even one second before I start playing. And it kind of makes me laugh that I, I really don't know what's going to happen. It's, <laughs> That's great. it's scary, uh, but it's kind of fun. And the band enjoy it. You know, sometimes I play little tricks and jokes with them. You know, like I, I had this little melody, duh, 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 and then I like, bump, bump, and have the, you know, I set up the notes to or little jokes. There was a joke, a wartime song. Um, it's to the tune of Colonel Bogey, which I think is a Sousa march. Ba -da, ba -da -da, beep, beep, beep. Oh, yeah. But anyway, oh, yes. that song in the, in the Second World War, the British uh, kind of soldiers used to sing a song which included a reference to, let's say, Hitler's genitalia, right? <laughs> and he didn't come out of it very well. And it was to do with the Albert Hall. Hitler has only got one ball. The other is in the Albert Hall. Da, 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 right? So when we played at the Albert Hall, I thought, I've got to play this melody, right? This is too, too much of an opportunity to miss. So I spent, I spent an hour in the afternoon. Da, 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 de, 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 right? Oh, uh, hang on. I'm going to need to, you know, and I figured it all out how I'm going to do it. Um, it was just too, because it's the Albert Hall. I, I couldn't resist it. You couldn't. Oh my God. That's. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I like doing silly things like that. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I think of your, your playing as being so creative and, and, and so it doesn't surprise me in the humor, of course, but, um, like your, your sound, like your, your, your drum sound is so central to like everything you do, whether it's like porcupine tree, King Crimson. And did you, I mean, you obviously have, you started working on your sound, I'm guessing when you were really young, like you, you had an understanding again, like a guy like Simon, like a lot of us, but 
you know that that's something that you worked on yeah and, and really... i guess and it's evolved you know i think any drummer's sound it starts with the drummer it's in your head it's all the references all those albums that you've heard and you thought oh yeah. man that's a great snare drum sound oh that's a beautiful tom sound i love that hi-hat sound all those little things you've collected in your mind and when you sit at your drums think man how can i get that hi-hat sound that so and so has or how does he get that backbeat so you develop this sort of set of preferences in your mind about the sound and you try to figure out how to get that sound whether it's kind of damping on the drum tuning the way you hit the drum or you know and it takes years and years and years to get there i always wanted to focus on a sound that i thought was a nice musical sound that i could use in almost any musical situation i didn't go down the sort of chameleon route where i've got a thousand drum kits and i can give you anything from a to z uh, of any style of drummer you want Stuart Copeland drum sound yeah I'll, hang on I'll just put that up you want you know 1975 uh, John Guerin yeah I can do that you know I, I although I, I love those drummers and their sound I wanted to be someone who had a recognizable identifiable sound and it it kind of all became the same thing with my playing the sound the technique the ideas everything's wrapped into one I can't yeah. isolate one from the other. And more recently in the last 20 years, because I've had a studio, I've started to learn a lot more about mixing drums. So most of the projects I do now, I just send a stereo mix of my drums. I don't want some engineer to have 16 tracks of drums and they're gonna decide how loud something should be or should there be compression on this or should I, have you know more reverb on that tom or i'll make all those decisions because actually the way i played the the decisions are already in there if yeah. you listen to the overheads my mix is already there i'm hitting the snare drum to the level that i want it to be in that particular piece of music and if you rebalance it and turn the snare drum right down on the bass drum right up it won't be the intention that I was going for, you know, with the creative idea of a, a unique rhythm for a song. So I, it bugged me more and more and more, the sessions I did where I sent off all the files and then eventually I'd hear the album and I'd think, oh no, oh my yeah. God, you've ruined it. Or if I knew that's the sound you were going for, I would have played different. You know, if I'm using like a lot of, uh, you know my hall and a lot of big compression and then you turn all that off and you've got me playing dead dry well I would have played different with that kind of sound in mind and normally when I work on a new song I'm thinking of the mix straight away mm -hmm. you know I'll do a test recording before I've even figured out the song I'll get on the drums and I'll play because maybe I think or maybe I'll use a different snare or a different tuning or I'll use a different ride or different hi-hats. The toms and the bass drum pretty much never change, but I would choose to slightly change the snare drum, the hi-hat and the ride. And then I do a little test recording and I immediately start to mix because if there's something wrong, I can't fix it later down the line if it was the wrong ride symbol. There's yeah. nothing in the mix I can do. If that ride cymbal bell was miles too loud, mm -hmm. I can't get rid of it. Yeah. You know, or the snare drum was just too deep. I can't tune it up <laughs> in a mix. So I need to know, you know, sometimes I'll do three or four test recordings over just say the verse and the chorus, and I'll change snares maybe four times. And then I'll sit there and listen to the four recordings and think, yeah, I like that snare. That's the one. That's the one. Maybe I'll tune it up a little bit. I've got to get the sound right first. And part of that is the mix. So when the sound of the mix is right, I know what I'm what it's meant to sound like. And then I can start figuring out, you know, the arrangement or if I can what what I can play on this song. But yeah, it's something you've got to follow through right from the grip of your stick 
all the way through the whole process, the mixing, the mastering, you know, the, everything in that chain. And there's a lot yeah. of things in that chain. Um, but the biggest thing is what's in your head, the sound you make. See, if I came and sat and played at your drums, they won't sound the same as when you play them. You know what I mean? You've set them up for your style and your sound and your tuning. And if you've got someone else to play, there would be three different versions of your Gretsch kit. The, the drummer makes an enormous difference to the sound, way more than the drums, the microphones, the preamps, all that stuff. The actual drummer makes the biggest difference. Yeah, that's that's some incredible information. That's that's and so and that's a fairly new um, process that you've begun, you know, somewhat recent in terms of like sending the the, the, the final complete uh, mix. Yeah, you know, about the last 10 years, I've been, you know, I got kind of disappointed so many times with how other people would mix my drums. Yeah. I just started, you know, on some of the projects, I say, listen, just put in my stereo drum mix. I'd rather, let me hear that. And when I hear it, I'll ask you to send me a drumless version of the song so I can load it into my track and then I can make some adjustments and then I'll produce, you know, Gav drum mix two, and I'll send you that. And then, you know, sometimes I've done 10, 15 mixes of the same passes over the same mix until I think I've got the best I can get from these drums and this performance. Yeah. Uh, but the, the mixing and the processing is a really a, something, if, if you've got a sound in your head, it's like you need to stay in control of it i'm just a control freak john really. no <laughs> i can relate to that believe me i'm not not to what you're talking about but to being a control freak but that's another story but no i think that's i think that's fabulous and and um you know i i, I totally get it i i i think that's that's got to be one of the most frustrating things i've spoken to other drummers that have said the same thing that probably haven't taken that kind of control but i know like you, you know, talking to Vinny, where, where he's told me that he's, he'll send a, you know, and this could have been going back some years too, prior to, to when, I mean, it could be different now, but he would send files and, and, you know, here are the final mix, as you say, and it would be a, a, a very different sort of interpretation of what he thought it was going to be. Like he, he sort of recorded a track thinking it was going to be this way. And, and it's, it's almost like, I think at a time anyway, it was you just expected it right i mean it was just like okay i'm gonna they're they're hiring me to to give them this track i'm going to give it to them it's going to be theirs to do with whatever they want but i i think your concept is way better because you're creating your part based on the sound you hear in your head and like you said if if they're going to change that if they're going to if they're going to put tons of reverb on the snare drum or they're going to do something very different from what you did then you you would have played it differently you would have maybe used a drum that was more live sounding or something. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, if they're going to put loads of reverb on, I would have played a lot less and vice yeah. versa. If I, yeah. if I envisaged it with lots and lots of reverb on, and then I hear it dead dry, I might think, well, I'd have played a different part. It sounds kind of silly now. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a modern world, John, we're in that in the old days, you would all be in a studio together and a band, you would record the session and you'd sit at the mixing desk and we'd mix it together or the engineer would mix it, but I would be sitting behind him and I would make comments about the drum mix. And it was that interactive thing, which is fantastic, but mm -hmm. it's not happening very often in today's world. And all the bands I play in, we all record remotely and send our parts in. So it's not ideal, but it's the way most records are made now. You just yeah. have to think, okay, well, that's the way it is now. I can't just keep banging on about the old days. Um, and in many, in many ways, apart from the, the fact that you miss the social interaction and the feedback from the engineer, the artist, the producer, the other band members, but there's quite a lot of advantages to doing it at home. And that means that I can spend five minutes or five days on the same song until I think I've got the best part I can come up with, with the best sound. 
Sometimes I come up with a good part, uh, but then the next day I want to change the sound or vice versa until I think, okay, this is, I've reached the point now where I think this is the best I can do for this song. And when you're in a studio, um, a commercial studio that's costing a lot of money with a lot of guys sitting around, the time is not on your side. You can't spend yeah. two hours just doing some strange snare drum overdub that after two hours, everyone thinks, including yourself, uh, that's not working. Okay, well, now you've just wasted, I don't know, a thousand dollars of time and everyone's kind of annoyed with you for wasting that much time. I can do that at home because it's not costing anything and I'm not wasting anyone's time. So I might try some really strange things and the next morning I might listen to it and think, no, they all suck. Right, let's forget that. I'm just going to start again. I'm just going to wipe everything I've done yesterday. I don't know where I was going, but I'm going to start again. And maybe I'm going to choose a different snare drum and a different ride cymbal. I'm going to take a different approach. So um, that's the great thing of working at home, that you, you've got time to not only work, but consider. And when you listen to something the next morning, in that first five minutes, you know everything that's wrong with it. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's the mix or your playing, it's suddenly obvious. But it wasn't obvious after 10 hours working yesterday what yeah. was wrong with it. Because, you, you, you know, you got tired, you got fatigued, your ears have gone, your mind's gone, and you just need a break. You know, considering is a really fabulous luxury to have. Yeah, yeah. Do you find too, do you, when you, when you get to that point, Gavin, do you, when you go, if you're going to go back and redo something, do you even like try different microphones? Do you go like that deep into the, into the weeds of like the sound um, of it or, or? Not very often. I mean, I do, having a studio, I do spend days where I just experiment. You know, I might experiment all afternoon just with bass drum mics, position, uh, different positions, mics inside, mics outside all different sorts of EQs and plugins, and then um, keep track of all of all the experiments, you know, like even the bass drum beater, that's going to make a different sound, you could buy or borrow 20 different bass drum beaters and record them one after the other. And you'll find that there's maybe one or two that really stand out as Oh, that's, that's so much better that one, I'm going to yeah. use that one on this bass drum. And that's the sort of thing you might waste two or three hours of an afternoon just messing around with bass drum beaters. There's plenty of times where, you know, I'm not busy and I might try different mics. I might experiment with different things. You know, you need to do a good A-B test. Like if you're going to try a Tom mic, the best way is to get the Tom mic you usually use, the one that you want you're interested in, get them side by side and make sure that you're recording the same hit is no there's no point hitting it then changing the mic then putting the new mic in and hitting it again because every hit is different so you need to be recording that in parallel and then maybe you just play you know on one tom just play a little bit record it on two tracks and then you need to devise a good uh, a good a b testing experiment so you match the level so they're the same volume and then you have let's say microphone A and it's two bars long, that piece of audio, and then it's the same piece of audio, I mean, it's the same performance, but now you're listening to mic B in mm -hmm. bars three and four, and then you make a four bar loop, you get your logic or whatever, your Pro Tools, you get it off the screen, go out of the room, get a cup of tea, come back and listen to it, you don't know where you are in the loop, so you're yeah. blind, you don't know, because yeah. you're just hearing bump, da -ba -da -dum -dum, yep. Dum, 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 you can't be influenced. Dum, 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 dum. Yeah. You know, and one is one mic and one is the other mic. They're the same volume. And you just sit here and really listen and think, that one's better. Now, let yeah. me get, yeah, I can hear it. And you get Logic back open. Think, wow, that's the mic I was already using. <laughs> so, you know, so because sometimes someone will lend you a mic that's like five times more expensive than the one you're using, and you'll convince yourself that's got to be better. Man, yeah, this is a $3,000 yeah. mic. This has got to be better. 
but don't fool yourself by the price or the name or the reputation. You've got to set up a blind test. Yeah, and I've done it with lots of things, with mic preamps, with microphones, you know, with all sorts of things. You've got to set up a really good A-B test because if one is louder than the other, you'll think the louder one is better. Yeah. So, uh, or, you know, you need to hear, you need to give it a fair chance. So every mic that I use on the kit has undergone a process and I've evolved through probably lots and lots of mics in the last 25 years until the point where I found the mic that I thought was best for that drum. You know, and I've got five toms. It doesn't mean that the same mic on all five drums will sound good. What sounds yeah. good on a 18 inch floor tom, that same mic might not sound good on an eight or 10 rack tom. So, yeah. and it's the same with the heads. You know, if you're using coated emperors or something or vintage coated emperors, or maybe one drum's really a bit dark and you put a, an ambassador on there. If the attack and the tone sounds even across all the drums, they don't necessarily have to be identical heads. Mm -hmm. You know, your, your eyes can really confuse you. You, you kind of see what things are like. You know, you go on a website and you see this snare drum and think, oh, that is the most gorgeous looking snare drum I've ever seen. It's got to sound great right and you've already <laughs> bought it with your eyes before you've even heard it you know people listen with their eyes many many times yeah. so i'm aware of that and i've fallen down on all those traps in the past and bought things that were really expensive because i thought they must be better but in a blind test i didn't pick them i actually picked you know what i was already using which might have been a fraction of the price you know you don't to get a really good drum recording, you don't actually need the world's most expensive mics. And now so many drummers, um, right from the ground up, are recording at home, whether it's in a little bedroom or in the garage or in the shed or whatever. You know, the remote recording thing is becoming a really big thing. And any drummer who's being professional or trying to be a professional drummer, I think are now getting around to the idea, if I want to do any kind of session, even a low paid demo session, I'm going to have to have a recording situation at home. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to start learning about mics, about gain structure, about EQ, about compression. And, you know, if you've got a little studio at home, you've got all the time in the world to experiment and get it on Logic or Pro Tools or whatever you've got and try pushing the faders and turning the knobs and see what it does. It's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is incredible information. This is this is great, man. Yeah. And and I, I don't know if you probably didn't hear my intro, but, you know, because we don't have a lot of time today, we're going to do a part two. I'm going to track you down at some point. Um, uh, same fee. <laughs> we'll do the same thing over again. Yeah, the, the, the same price, John. <laughs> oh, the same price. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to read a question um, from my pal, Anthony Amadeo. Um, can you ask Gavin about his wonderful unorthodox grip? I see he, that he plays with very different grip in each hand yeah. and always and always point to him when people claim all the great drummers play with perfectly fulcrum grip. No, that's nonsense. So what I do is the left hand, I grip with the little finger, mm -hmm. right? And this is for the sound, the back bit. I always do a rim shot backbeat. Right. I never do the backbeat where I just play the center of the head. It's always a rim shot. And I control the vibration of the stick. I'm holding it right at the back there like that. Sometimes these two fingers aren't even involved in the uh, making of the, of the snare drum sound. And I play a lot of the ghost notes just with my wrist. So I get that consistent backbeat sound. Now you can see drummers, Tony Williams did this quite a lot. Gary Husband does this. I saw a drummer the other day, I think her name is uh, Madison Class. And she, and I, first thing is, I, I'm sorry if I got her name wrong. I clicked on a video because I saw her grip and her grip was the same grip I've got, the back. Wow. And she had a great snare drum sound. In fact, in the comments, people were saying, man, you've got a great snare drum sound. She was sitting kind of low, which I like, and she mm -hmm. was hitting the rim shot but with that closed back of the hand and it was 
oh, it was popping, absolutely mm. beautiful. And in the right hand, you know, I'm, I'm kind of more, I don't use this little finger very much. So, you know, I hold the sticks way at the back, more mm. than, you know, uh, you'd probably get arrested for holding them this far back. Sometimes <laughs> I've seen videos where I've stopped it and my, my stick is like this. It's literally, I'm not even touching the stick with these two, right? And this is a really big, this is almost 17 inch stick. These are yeah. like tree trunks, these sticks. And it just feels good to me. You know, it just, it just feels right. I could hold the sticks up here with a traditional grip. Uh, I mean, a much more sort of orthodox son of grip. Yeah. It just doesn't feel right. And I can't get the sound I want. So, yeah. I mean, a, drum, a, a, a proper drum teacher would probably shoot you for playing like this, <laughs> but it just feels right. And the, the backbeat snare drum sound, I can only get with this kind of closed, uh, closed grip at the back. And occasionally I see drummers on YouTube and I think, yeah, they're getting a really good backbeat snare drum sound. Uh, and this girl I saw the other day was doing exactly that. But, you know, there's... Uh, a lot of guys do this. You you probably saw Tony Williams yeah. play on that, right? Yeah. And I, I wonder I wonder if she's seen you play and that and that influenced her grip, possibly. I I wouldn't be surprised. You know? Who knows? Who knows? Well, you even if even if she had, you wouldn't admit it. So <laughs> that's that's the the humble Gavin that I know. Um I'm gonna just see if there's any other questions because we're we're coming up to an hour i can't believe it i can't believe it um uh, but this is great gavin this is so much great information that you're you're sharing with everybody and i really appreciate that um i was gonna say i you i wanted to talk about your home studio and you and you did quite a bit there too and was last year given that you weren't able to tour um you must have been i'm guessing busier than usual yeah i've been I've been crazy busy since the start of this COVID thing. I can't wait for it to be over so I can have a rest. Um, it's, yeah, project after project has come come through and lots of albums that I thought about playing on and projects that, you know, I've had sitting in the wings for a long time. I could work on those. Yeah, I'm always in the middle of some album or another and, um, yeah, it's been a lot of work the last 18 months. Uh, it's been a lot. And yeah, I thank my lucky stars for having a place at home that I could practice and record. Yeah. So it's been, it's been, a, it's been very lucky. That's been, and that's the same studio you've had that for you. you this is the studio that you told me about years ago that yeah. you were doing some, yeah, master classes and things like that as well. No, I don't do master classes here. I mean, I've done I've done a couple of remote yeah. drum clinics. Um, I did a couple of Zildjian remote drum clinics, but they put me up on a big screen. I think one was in Gorky Park in in Moscow, mm. and uh, another one I did in a sh in a drum shop in Ukraine when it was uh, a while ago when I couldn't actually fly there. So they put me up on a huge screen in the shop and I could see everyone in the audience. So they asked me questions yeah. and it was, it was really, really nice. And I, and I was playing, I had it all figured out coming through the desk and uh, it was, it was really good fun. It's not the same as being there, but in a situation where you can't be there, uh, it's, it's not a bad second place. It's pretty, pretty great. Yeah. I mean, and that, that's sort of the, the, uh, the forerunner to, what we've just experienced for the past year too, where that it it could in some way be the future. I think people want to see in person uh, something like a drum clinic. I I think anyway, it's 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 nice to be able to sort of you know see people in person and 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 be in that you know in that moment experience it. But but that's a great it's a great alternative, you know. To yeah, yeah, that. sure. Yeah, um, Bob Terry is asking. <laughs> when we might see you with the pineapple thief uh, okay well we do have a tour in october uh european tour and we're hoping that will all go ahead um we've got some rehearsals planned and that happens pretty soon after i get back from 
King Crimson, if all the shows that are meant to happen this year actually happen, I'm going to be working from mid-July till Christmas with pretty little time in between, wow. um, less than I would like. It's always uh, kind of one, it's, <laughs> it's always too much <laughs> or nothing, isn't it? You, yeah, you're trying to get yeah. the balance right of, you know, just doing the right amount of work and the right amount of studio work and the right amount of live work. It's out of your control. So you either do too little or too much. But, you know, I haven't played live in the last 18 months. Um, I think uh, no, December the 12th or something was the last, 2019 was the last live show I did. And, and sadly, I actually had lunch with Bill Riflin that day because we played in Seattle, his hometown. Yeah. And that was December 2019. So that was the last show I ever played. I had lunch with Bill and I never saw him again, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I, I only met him that one time uh, when I saw you in 2014 in Boston. And, and uh, he was, he was, uh, you know, I, we chatted for a while. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, you know, the REM stuff and, and, you know, all his work and, and very humble. Um, what's the right word? Just a, a, a very understated guy, I guess you could say. Right. Yeah, and nice he, guy. Nice guy. Yeah, very nice guy, and and um, yeah, fine. You know, great musician. But you've got another great guy in the band now too. So who's that? Jeremy. Oh Jeremy. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, Jeremy. <laughs> oh that guy. Yeah. Oh that guy. <laughs> we speak all the time, me and Jeremy. We have a good laugh. I know. I know. Yeah. No, we we were talking about you that day, and he's he. I forget what he said. It was a similar kind of thing. And, and he said something like it's his birthday today. It's Gavin's birthday today. So I know he's not watching this or something. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, but um, yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm sensitive to the time here. And as we come up to an hour, I'm thinking, I'll just see if there's any other questions. I always say I'm going to keep it to an hour and then we go longer. But so I, I don't want to, I don't want to do that today, but um I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank Gavin for being here today. Uh, Tim Root says, cool. Any other things you want to talk about, Gav, that's um, pr other projects you've been working on, things coming out in the next? Well, we've been, we've been busy, you know, the three drummers talking about the upcoming tour because we don't have a lot of time to rehearse. So we need to do some kind of working at home, kind of pre-rehearsal stuff. Because um, I think we've only got about five or six days rehearsal before the tour starts. And to play, what do we have? 37 songs. To rehearse 37 difficult songs back up to full speed, you know, you're going to have to do some homework because we haven't played since October 2019, the last wow. gig was in Chile. Yeah, so, you know, I've got charts and I've got all sorts of notes and things. I'm going to have to go through them all. Uh, but, you know, on stage, we don't, the, at least the drummers don't have any charts. We couldn't, we're set up at the front of the stage. We couldn't have a great big music stand and yeah. all the charts. So you need to learn it. And that's, that's hard, you know, trying to remember really what's coming next. In other bands I play in where we have a, a backing track or something and I've got in-ear monitors in, I can actually record myself on the backing track telling myself what's coming next. No like a sat-nav, like a sat-nav GPS guide. Okay, uh, <coughs> five eight section coming up. Here we go. One, two, three. You know, and I, I talk my way through the song so I can sit on stage um really quite drunk and not go wrong <laughs> that's that's I, I don't actually drink but um <laughs> it's but that's very helpful in some situations except when the computer crashes and you play the song without the and then you realize you don't actually know where <laughs> where yeah. the, you don't know the arrangement of the song <laughs> and that's happened uh, on big songs like you know in porcupine tree we had a song 17 minutes long and the uh, the computer crashed in like the first 30 seconds. So we played the other 16 and a half minutes 
I thought, wow, I don't really know how long some of these sections are without listening for the cue, because I've always got a cue in my ears. I've always got a recording in my ears of what's happening. Oh, dear, I really better. <laughs> this is going to be scary, you know. Wow, I see, you know, and, and Jeremy had told me that, and that's why I hadn't asked you, but I, I kind of assumed you guys had charts or some reference, like for some of those arrangements that, that you know, you were reading some part of it, but it, he said the same thing, basically, that it's, you know, you've got to learn it, you've got to learn it and memorize it, which yeah. that, kind of, that blows my mind that you guys are, are, I mean, if you were reading it, it would make sense, like, okay, that, you know, you're just, that, well, that would you, be you know so this, much easier. Yeah. That would be really easy. You'd always have that visual representation of what's going on, what's coming. And, you know, and when we play new songs or new arrangements, I do have a chart and I have it set up at rehearsal, but it's not long before I think I've got to stop looking at that thing because otherwise yeah. I won't be able to play without looking at it. I've done that in the past with other bands and then I've had the charts on the floor and I'm kind of, you know, I just I lost yeah. my confidence in being able to play the whole song without the chart but you've got to force yourself to do it. Once you get through the whole song without messing up, without the chart, something in your head just goes off and you think, yeah, I can do this. Mm -hmm. But just having the chart on the and having a sneaky look, you know, you just start to rely on it too much. And so I, I wanted to get out of that habit. I've done that in the past and it's, it's always been a crutch that I've just, like, I just couldn't put the charts away. And, uh, it's better to do it without. Yeah, yeah. Just like you say, just just forcing yourself to at some like maybe when you first see the music, it helps to have it written down, and you can at least sort of get through it. But at a point, you got to force yourself to not look at it and commit it to memory. And and yeah, the and, first and, time and I do it without there. the chart, I can actually still see the chart. It's not photographic memory, but I can kind of remember what the chart looked like. And then over the next few times, it just slowly goes in and I hear it in the music rather than, oh, there's 18 bars of this and then there's that phrase and then there's seven bars of this. So I stop counting and I just hear it as the composition. I mean, if someone else in the band goes wrong, you're screwed because your reference point has gone. Yeah. So uh, it does happen in King Crimson from time to time someone goes wrong and they completely throw you because they start playing a part that doesn't match with your head at that point. You think, oh, hang on, this is all, oh, what's happened? Mm -hmm. We're in a whole different world now. And that's, um, that does happen in King Crimson. Things go wrong. It's hard to recover from that. That's good to hear that, that things go, that stuff happens, not just in my band. <laughs> Yeah, but the music's so weird, no one can tell. <laughs> Sometimes we've played, we've messed up songs so badly, and people have come up at the end and said, "Man, that's that was like a perfect show. I'd never seen so such brilliant." And I'm, what? You know, we completely screwed up some song to the point where it almost just crumbled into pieces. Um, <laughs> I know one night uh, Tony Levin made a massive mistake on one song and it threw everyone. We all ended up going in different directions and it was just chaos. And it was so funny that we spent about two minutes trying to get back on track. And um, Tony wrote this big blog about how he, how he screwed King Crimson up. And then uh, the manager put that recording online so people could follow it along with Tony's story. <laughs> Oh, that's so, fantastic. And it yeah. is weird music, but man, we got so lost, you know, and I'm looking across at Jeremy and Pat and we're kind of looking at each other, nodding and winking and no one <laughs> knows what's going on. It's funny. Oh, it sounds like my band the other night during Aqualung, <clears throat> but <laughs> uh, well, when I was going to, and I, I don't think I asked Jeremy this and then I'll, we'll wrap it up after this, but are you guys, is everybody list playing or listening to a click or is there some is there is there some click happening for all you guys to stay click what click yeah <laughs> no there is sometimes there's, yeah. there's some some of the time there's a click you know with a really large group like this and we're spread out across the stage it would be really really tough there's so many moments where 
you know, we all come in together and then sometimes it stops and then there's just sax and then there's a little bit of guitar and then we all come back in. Yeah, It's like, you know, when you get a band that's so many members spread out across the stage, you need a conductor, ideally. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a conductor. So sometimes the click is the conductor. It keeps us together in certain places. You know, the monitoring is really hard. Hearing everyone well during the concert in your little in-ear monitors is really tough. It's not like we're a jazz group and we're all, you know, close to each other and I can hear them acoustically. We're yeah. so spread out, you know, sometimes, and in a big ambient hall, I can see Pat, he's like 25 foot away. You know, there would be a massive delay as well because right. of the, the, the speed of sound. So Pat's already like 75 milliseconds behind me if I hear him acoustically. So I've got to have him in my ears. And, you know, the click just holds things together. We don't do every song with a click, but there are quite a few that just yeah. we've got to have it because it's just it's just too it just makes the band sound better. We're, yeah. we're, we're together, you know, in a better way. The, and I, I assume that, yeah. And I, I guess my question was, is it the entire show? But you've answered that. It's not. It's not every song, but no. yeah, you, you've got to for some songs. Yeah, yeah. Well, when we when we do the next one, seriously, I'd love to talk more about. You just mentioned having like Pat and and Jeremy in your ears, and I'd love to talk about that in the next one, like the the sort of monitor mixes that you guys have, and I I just if nothing else i just think that stuff is so interesting to know like what you're going for in your ears maybe what pat's going for and jeremy and yeah you know, and it's a very different world from where i started like with monitors and you know playing without earplugs it's it's a very different world now and you know and and the equipment you can buy really inexpensive equipment for your band and everyone can have an ipad i've got an ipad here and your own individual mix with these virtual faders. And you can do your own mix during the gig. You can turn things up and down. It doesn't affect mm -hmm. the outer front house. It doesn't affect the other guys. It's, it's a miracle, technically, what you can do now. And at the end of the day, you just want to be comfortable on stage. You want to hear what you want to hear. You want to be able to feel the other guys and feel comfortable. It's inspiring when you can hear everyone and the drums sound nice. You feel yeah. like playing, but I'm sure you and millions of other drummers like me have spent some horrible days on stage where it sounded horrible and you've got little monitors and you can't hear anything and it's all nasty and you come off stage like, oh man, I hope it was good out front because it was horrible where I was sitting. And yeah. those days are kind of over. There's no excuse now. You can control your sound, your mix, you can have reverb, you can have the reverb on the drums and you can have as much of the vocalist or as little as the vocalist as you want. You know, the old days of having massive monitors on stage and everything being so loud. Yeah. Um, you know, my tinnitus is, is pretty bad from those days. I mean, I, I called the tinnitus helpline, but it was just ringing and ringing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it'd be sh yeah. <laughs> that's great no i i would love to talk more about that that's and, and you're so right I've about got that, some though. other jokes yeah i know there, you do. there's other jokes i'll save them john all right that sounds great I, I i mean it too hopefully before you get really busy in july we can we can come back and do another one of these yeah sure love to do it love it happy to all right Thank you. Thank you so much, Gavin. If you can hang with me for one second, I'm going to end the live stream and I'm going to thank everybody for watching. Um, great. Wow. We had a great turnout today. It's fantastic. Thanks for rolling with us, everybody, too, and the time changes and especially Gavin for being so accommodating. And uh, I don't have a planned next episode at this very moment, but stay tuned because there will be one. Um, but a big hand for Gavin Harrison. Thank you. The fabulous fabulous musician, person, human being, uh, all around great guy. So thanks for watching, everybody. Uh, stay tuned for the next one. We'll see you soon. I'll see you in one second, Gavin.